So this was the result of comparing uh, the conjecture by Watson to counting a, a little bit further. And uh, I think it shows that the naive idea of Watson to compare with 1 over x log x is not going to work. So what I want to do now is to start from the beginning and be uh, a lot more systematic in the approach uh, of dealing with the output of this experiment. And this is really the point of visualization is that we, you know, we generate data, uh, usually more data than we can sort of process by reading lists. So we try to put it up on some sort of uh, graph or visual uh, explanation. And of course, uh, then we need to deal with the fact that such a, a graph is, uh, is something that the human mind is, in a sense, a little bit too good at, at interpreting. So we're very good at sort of seeing patterns, seeing uh, systematic behavior, even so good that we sometimes see things that aren't really there. So we need to be more uh, systematic. And in fact, what I'm going to use is, is pretty much the standard toolbox that you probably know if you studied uh, physics in, in high school uh, for sort of dealing with uh, a standard output from a standard uh, scientific er experiment. And so it really it's, uh, it's fitting, it's looking for lines and that kind of thing that uh, you've probably seen before, but probably also never used very much in the context of, uh, of uh, university math. So um, so what I'm going to do, and, and we can just get this started right away, I mean, one thing that we, we can do is to use this trick of, uh, of comparing uh, data, um, of, of transforming data in, in various ways. And uh, for instance, what I can do is I can switch to a log-log scale, right? So when I went to high school, this was actually paper that we were given in hand, I don't think that happens anymore. Uh, but what I'm going to do is I'm changing the both axes to uh, a log scale, uh, knowing that uh, if I have data that behave uh, via a power law, then I will get a straight line in this uh, setting. I also know that a semi-logarithmic uh, um, setup, which puts one of the axes in a logarithmic uh, scale, will be right, uh, straight lines if I have something which behaves either exponentially or logarithmically. So when I've done this, you can see that there's very clearly uh, a straight line here. The, these are the observations. And when I transform the log, this so little happens that it looks like a straight line. This is not a straight line. But you can see that it's a wrong straight, straight line anyway. So, so really, you know, what we want to do here is to say, OK, if we can put ourselves in the situation where we can transform the data that we get out of our experiment into something that looks like a straight line, then probably this is something that means something and then we can use it to analyze uh, the experiment, the output of the experiment we've made. Okay, in order so to, to do this more systematically, I want to have more um, uh, points, uh, data points than just the 50 that I created uh, during the last uh, video. And uh, I don't think I want to spend too much time on it now, but uh, there's a way explained in the book uh, to speed up the computation a little bit. So the idea is that I will make what is usually called a mutually recursive sequence uh, procedure. So you can see I have a procedure uh, called D tower calling R tower, and I have something called R tower calling D tower. So I have these two procedures calling each other, and the, uh, the recursive computation of the tower, the counts of the number of towers studied by Watson, uh, is put into this uh, setting. And the, the reason why I did it this way is that D tower, as you can see, has no option remember, whereas R tower has an option remember. And, and that's by design. So the point is that the D tower uh, part of the, the program uh, does some pre-computation to ease the computations of the, um, of the um, number of towers and to save time this way. And it does this very quickly, so there's really no need to store this information. In fact, storing the information would make the whole procedure slower because then we would have so much information that it takes time to pull it out. Right? So it's faster to just go directly and do these computations. And the ideas are very simple. If, if, for instance, I want to know how many towers have the weight 
uh, w and w happens to be negative, then uh, by symmetry that's the same as if I pass from w to minus w. So uh, that's what I'm doing here. So I'm going into the remember portion with only positive weights. So this means that the uh, remember table that our tower generates uh, is only half as big as it used to be because the negative weights are not stored because there's no remember option in D tower. And you can sort of do the same if the, the weight is too big so that you cannot reach that kind of weight then you can just return a zero uh, also without storing anything and if that's not the case then you use R tower and then uh, a remember option is actually generated and then we do the same the whole way through. So um, let's uh, see what we can do with this. So uh, I'm going to compute um, the numbers between 200 and 250. And this is going to take a little while, um, but there you have it. So um, these are the, the pure numbers. So just to impress you a little bit, so the, this is the last number I computed was D tower 250.0 and you can see that's a that's a pretty big number probably something with 115 ish letters or digits and of course the the point that I'm trying to make so you know this this shows you that it's a relatively efficient uh, procedure we have here and that having only 12 uh, entries is not uh, not necessary in at all in a situation like this these are the uh, the pure numbers where I haven't divided by 3 to the N because I want to be more systematic and say, okay, are we sure that it's reasonable to compare these, uh, this output with 3 to the N, or rather 3 to the N minus 1, which is the total number of, of, um, of towers. And you know, to get an idea of this, we can go in and change the axis again. Uh, this time I'm only going to change one of them because this is uh, the idea is that we're having an exponential growth, so I'm putting uh, a logarithmic scale on the y coordinates and keeping it standard scale on the x coordinates, so this is a standard semi logarithmic plot. And as you can see, I get a, uh, a something that looks a lot like a real line. And if I put a one to one, uh, uh, oh no, I'm not going to do that because that actually is not going to work for, for something like this. Uh, I'll do that in a second. Okay, so, so this sort of shows that this is, this is clearly uh, an exponential growth. And uh, we should now try to see if we can analyze this exponential growth. And then I'm going back to the idea that I'm sure you've seen before that I'm going to make a fit of these uh, observations with a line. Now, when I do this, it's extremely important. We discussed this at length in the book, so I'm not going to say so much about it now, but it's extremely important that you think about where you try to make the uh, the linear um, approximation because there's always a, a transformation going on here. So really, you know, what I'm doing when I'm passing to a, a semi-logarithmic plot is that I'm taking the y coordinates and I'm instead of plotting them as they are, I plot their logarithm. So that means that I'm making a transformation where I'm taking the the the, the correct or the, the actual output of the experiment and transforming it in this case by taking a logarithm. Now, then when I try to deal with these uh, informations, when I, for instance, try to make a fit, then uh, the best fit will, the best fit of the transformation is almost never the transformation of the next best fit. So, so there's sort of a non-commutativity here that is important. And um, I think I have no good solution to this. I, the one solution that I would always uh, emphasize is that you, whenever you try to work with fitting of this kind of data, probably with any kind of data, but, but still, uh, then you need to uh, plot the results together with your fit to get an idea of whether it looks correct. And so that's what I'm going to do now. So first of all, I'm going to make an explicit conversion to the uh, logarithm. So I'm, I'm plotting here not n and d tower n, but n and the logarithm of d tower. And of course, I'm getting the same uh, graph as I did up here, but now it's setting so that I've set it up so that it comes in the exact same, um, um, it comes in the, uh, in the correct uh, standard x, y coordinate system. Then I do a fit, 
And let's return later to how this is done, but essentially I'm asking Mabel to find the best uh, expression of the form ax plus b, i.e. the best line, uh, which uh, then gets as close as possible to the observations. And you can see this sort of a strange uh, syntax here, which has to do with the fact that the fit operation or procedure that lives in the statistics package um, has once the the first coordinates in one uh, vector and the second coordinate in another vector. So I have to do it like this. Uh, but the output is fairly straightforward, and you can see that the the, the line that I have has a, a slope which is a little over uh, one, which is sort of consistent with the fact that we're seeing the same type of numbers on the two axes. And then according to my uh, philosophy, I want to show you the fit together with the observations, and you can see that this is in fact something that looks very convincing. Right? So, I mean, not only uh, does the line fit the um, data very well, uh, it is also, there's no sort of, exp uh, no sort of uh, exceptions, and I'm doing this fairly fair, far out in the sequence, so I'm not encountering sort of any uh, initial behavior that might be off from the, from the end. Now, as I'm sure you know, whenever you do a fit, you're using the least squares method, and you're finding sort of you're minimizing the distance from the uh, observations to the uh, line, and you can get uh, a number that sort of explains the distance, uh, the, the minimized distance, that sort of tells you how good a fit this is. A number like this, I'm sure, is used in many other contexts, but I have to say I've never really felt like using it in, a, in an experimental context, because these numbers, I mean, are not very uh, helpful, I think, what you need to sort of have a, f a fit and a figure like what I'm showing you here that uh, is convincing. Now, what is the uh, rate of growth? Well, the rate of growth is, uh, um, I mean, so if you transform back to take, I mean, so, I mean, I've compared um, n with the logarithm of the number of towers at n, uh, so if I want to know what the approximation is of the original uh, sequence, I need to take uh, x of this, and I can have this cleaned up a little bit. And so this is my um, this is my exponential um, approximation, and you can see that the base of the exponential growth is a number that's very close to three. And so uh, actually, so it's sort of a coincidence that these numbers are. Are close to each other that's because e and 3 are relatively close that's why this looks like a slope 1 almost uh, but you can sort of see that it's a it seems like a reasonable uh, hypothesis that what we're encountering here is a sequence that grows like 3 to the n so that's the first step so let's assume from now on that Watson was right about this part of his analysis that it makes sense to compare the uh, concrete observations uh, to 3 to the n minus 1, which is the total number of, um, of towers.